um, since I'm not really sure what was received last time, considering all the problems. So I apologize for causing any deja vu uh, the public. Anyway, um, yes, I will talk about indirect searches on new physics uh, at LHC. Uh, this is my main line of investigation, and um, I wanted to introduce myself to the to the department in this way. Um, so good. So with the discovery of the Higgs, we have finally have a good uh, description of how nature works at a fundamental level up to more or less one TV to the. Mm, okay, so now, of course, uh, however, that leaves us with a lot of unanswered questions, some more uh, theoretical in nature, like uh, what is the right uh, uh, description of uh, quantum of the gravity at a quantum level? Um, is there a unified description of all the forces and all the fundamental forces? And if not, why their couplings are so similar? Um, and uh, is it, why 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 we we see such a large difference between the two fundamental scale of um, two fundamental scales that we know of the Lettwick scale and the Planck scale, or if you want, why is gravity so 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 weak with respect to the other forces? Um, there are also other more phenomenological, let's say, more experimental questions, uh, like uh, what is the origin of the masses of the neutrinos? Um, what is the nature of dark matter? And why do we see uh, an asymmetry in the baryon antibaryon content of the universe? Um, now, all of these questions don't really have a, 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 we don't know where the answer could lay and could be anywhere between where we are now to the Planck scale. Uh, that leaves us, of course, a huge amount of space, a huge amount of landscape to, to investigate. Um, however, one can um, at least find a motivation to, to try to look for new physics around the TV scale or a little bit above since some of the problems that uh, the some of the questions that I talked about earlier have natural uh, solution uh, about around the electric scale or involve the electric scale itself. So, of course, to look for that kind of physics, the best way, or at least one of the ways, is through uh, colliders. So, the the question naturally becomes: How do we look for new physics at colliders? Um, one way is to directly look for something new that we uh, we did we weren't expecting a new bump or in or some uh, missing energy. Uh, and uh, otherwise, uh, we can go to a more subtle route uh, where instead of looking for something new, we, we we look at what we already know pretty well, the standard model. And we just simply to find uh, um, something that is uh, odd, let's say some um, some new process, some process that that is not uh, completely well described in the standard model. Um, of course, the two methods uh, saying that there are two options is not exactly correct because, in principle, we should try to explore both of them at the same time. Uh, however, it is true that different accelerators have different properties and tends to, to behave better in one or the other search. Uh, usually electron positive machines tend to be better at precision physics due to the fact that you have a much better control of the initial states. Uh, while hadron colliders, um, such as the LHC, tends to be better at discovery since they can reach more easily higher energies. However, this doesn't mean that you cannot do a, um, discovery in electroprosidon machines or um, precisions at the electron collider, at the hadron collider. And I'm actually talking here about exactly that precisions at the LHC. Um, so, as I was saying before, direct searches um, can be, uh, I mean, the, the point of direct searches is to find a bump. So, they, on the sense, they are necessity for discovery, since uh, usually it's difficult to claim any new physics without actually seeing it, uh, seeing the new physics. 
Uh, however, then usually um, in order to do that, to go to that route, you actually have to have a good idea of what kind of model you're looking for. Uh, you not you need to know um, you have to know where to look for and what you're looking for before actually going there. So they 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 rely heavily on model building on that sense. On the other hand, indirect searches are virtually model independent since the only model that you really need to know is the standard model itself that we have. Um, but on the other hand, it, there is a more difficult interpretation of the result. Um, and so that comes back into direct searches because uh, you can see that while you can cast indirect searches can help you cast a wider net and have an idea of where new physics could lay, could lie and go, um, then you can go with direct searches and try to find this new physics. Okay, so what's the situation right now? Well, uh, with the LHC, the situation is that up to May 2020, and I don't think that anything really new came out in the last months, um, we didn't find anything. LHC didn't find any new particle, any new, um, uh, any new, new physics state uh, at LHC. Uh, of course, there have been many, many, many different uh, uh, scenarios that have been studied. I'm not going over them, but uh, for now, there is no evidence on any new physics at LHC. The only new particle that have been um, discovered is the Higgs itself. That, however, looks very, very similar to what would, you would expect from a standard model Higgs. Here you have, in this plot, you have the coupling of the Higgs to the vector bosons and the third generations, well, uh, the, 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 the fermions. And you can see that in, in terms of their masses, sorry, and you can see that uh, they reproduce pretty well what you expect from a standard model Higgs. However, this is not the end of the story because when we look a little bit closer to, to the Lagrangian, the Higgs, we notice that while it's true that we know the coupling of the Higgs to vector bosons and third generation fermions um, as, uh, as good as five and 10%, um, we still uh, lack information apart on other generations, uh, other fermion generation, we also lack information on the um, Higgs potential. Um, so we see that there is still uh, there is still new physics that it could be um, hidden somewhere in the in 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 in, uh, uh, in the physics we already know in the standard model. So now in this in this talk, I would like to address uh, a few points. First of all, that precise measurements can tell us something about new physics, even if we don't find any new bump at LHC. Um, that, uh, however, a strong theoretical uh, knowledge of with this process of the standard model processes is equally important in order to actually have meaningful measurements. And finally, that the Higgs sector is a particularly interesting place for this kind of studies. Um, so to go over this, I would like to uh, bring you a couple of examples. Uh, first example is the Higgs potential. Um, so the Higgs potential is uh, well known to be to have this nice ball of champagne bottle, uh, bottom of a champagne bottle shape. Uh, however, one can wonder what is its uh, how how does he behave at higher energies? Um, so there are many. There are basically three options. Uh, one is that uh, the potential simply is stable. Uh, maybe uh, with some new local minimum up there that could explain stuff like inflation or other new physics, but mainly is just a stable potential and with a stable electroweak minimum. Otherwise, it could be unstable at some point. Um, or the, the third possibility is that while the potential is stable, uh, the electric minimum is not. This is a metastable uh, option. Uh, in, of course, in general, metastability means that you have a time scale in mind. And just for reference, uh, the time scale he is, he, here is the age of the universe. So uh, if the electric um, minimum is unstable, but with a decay time longer than the age of the universe, we talk about metastability. Otherwise, it would be an unstable uh, minimum. 
why do we care? Because of course, if uh, if the if the um, if the potential were unstable, then we wouldn't be here wondering about the stability of the potential in the first place. Uh, so that means that we know that is not unstable. However, the question then becomes: so What does the standard model predict? Because if the sonar model predicted an unstable potential, then we would know for sure that some new physics had to appear at a low energy, at a low scale, uh, low enough to um, at a, uh, low enough to save, let's say, the, the potential from becoming unstable. So, what is the Higgs potential at high energies? Well, let's we can start with the potential low energies and ignore the uh, vacuum expectation value of the Higgs, since that's a low energy object. So, the only thing that we're really interested in is um, the quartic the, the quartic coupling lambda. And in order to know how a lambda behaves, we just need to solve a system of uh, differential equations known as the RG. Uh, to remind you, um, the RG in general have this shape where G is a standard model parameter, mu is a scale of energy at which your investigate is the parameter, let's say, and beta is a function of all the parameter of the standard model. An interesting fact is that um, generally the beta function of a parameter G is proportional to some power of G itself. So as you remember from uh, calculus, that means that um, you can never uh, cross, G can never cross zero. So if it's is it's positive, it stays positive, or it's negative, it stays negative. Uh, this, however, is not true for lambda, and make it and that makes it more interesting because if you look at the beta function of lambda, you find out that it is not multiplicative but rather additive. Um, with these two terms here are the most relevant and the rest of the of the beta function are in the dots is in the dot uh, what uh, what these terms are telling us is that if the higgs is if the sorry if a lambda is uh, large at some low scale meaning that the higgs is heavy at that scale then uh, you you expect lambda to become very large at high energies, possibly non-perturbative, and in general your potential stays positive. On the other hand, if you have a U curve of the top uh, large at low energies, meaning that the mass of the top it's heavy, then you can expect um, you, you can expect lambda to become negative at some point, so your nice champagne bottle becomes a dog bowl. Uh, so where are we? Um, if you do the calculation simply using what I showed you earlier about a beta function, you find out easily that we are in an unstable uh, in, in an unstable situation. So this is this in plot that we have the mass of the Higgs versus the mass of the top, and the red region is the instability region. The the oval are the uncertainties on the mass of the Higgs and mass of the top. This is a little older, so don't take it exactly like that, but that basically is the, is the result. And you can see that um, we are at least a few sigmas away from a metastability. However, this is uh, not enough to claim new physics, unfortunately, because um, as I said, this is only a leading order on a perturbative exp um, expansion. So first order on a perturbative expansion. So we have to care about precision in, in this, precision calculation in this case. So uh, let's start with the beta functions. Um, there have been many groups that have calculated the, the, the correction to the beta functions and putting everything together more or less give us this result where you can see that while the lambda is expected not to, 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 to change a lot in its running, uh, it's, still try, it's still probably going towards zero and probably crossing at some point. So what you would expect is actually an unstable electroweak vacuum. However, this is not everything, of course, because since we are talking about a system of differential equations, we need to define well the initial conditions. Now, the initial conditions, of course, would mean to measure lambda. However, this is an incredibly difficult task. And I will go talking about that later in the second half of this talk. However, for now, we can just replace lambda with, um, with some other objects that we know very well, the mass of the Higgs and the Fermi constant. 
And we know their measurements extremely well, so we are happy about that. Unfortunately, this also is a, this simple relation is also spoiled by perturbative corrections, and we have to deal about with deal with them. Um, th so these corrections have been calculated, and my collaborators and I calculated the most uh, co com complete uh, next to next to leading order and two loops calculations. Uh, corrections and the result of all of that um, jets put together is this plot here where again we have the mass of the Higgs against the mass of the top and the red region is instability the green region is stability and the yellow is metastability and we are in a little box uh, more or less in the center up but if we uh, zoom in we see that uh, again the ovals are the uncertainties uh, on, on the measurement of the mass of the Higgs and mass of the top. And it looks like we are in a metastable vacuum, um, more or less three sigmas away from uh, real stability, but many sigmas away from pure in, um, instability. Uh, so the most pre recent calculation on exactly the time decay of the vacuum in this situation is, uh, is telling us that the electrobic vacuum has a, let's say, time of decay of around 10 to the 140 years, so well, be, uh, well above the age of the universe. So from one point of view, this is telling us that at least we are not to worry about um, being dissolved into nothing in the near future, but it's also telling us that we don't really need any new physics to appear at some scale in order to save the standard model. So the standard model itself is a theory that apparently at least reproduces, at least, uh, reproduces what we see, at least on this point of view. So um, this is example one. So let me go on example two. For example two, I want to talk about electric precision observables. Uh, remember this because we'll go back to this um, many times. So, um, in particular, I want to talk about the mass of the Higgs, uh, sorry, mass of the W and Z bosons, the mixing angle, uh, the electroweak mixing angle, uh, the Fermi constant that, as you know, is connected to the decay of the muon and the vac vacuum expectation value of the Higgs, and the fine structure constant that everyone knows what it is. So, um, why why this? Well, first of all, because they are the uh, most precisely known electroweak parameters. So the most precisely known parameters in, um, in uh, high energy physics. Uh, but also because there are a lot of uh, nice relations between them that, are, that comes from uh, the fact that they, they uh, from, from the existence of the electroweak gauge symmetry. And some of these relations are more complicated, some are more easy to write, but the point is that if, if you can measure these, all these parameters very, very well, then you can find inconsistencies and see if there is uh, any suggestion of some new physics appearing anywhere. Um, of course, also these relations has to be corrected with, uh, with uh, perturbative calculations. For example, the mass of the W is, can be rewritten in terms of these, of those electroweak precision observables, plus some new uh, function delta R that is um, a function of all the of the correction that come from quantum physics, and of course it depends on all the electroweak parameters, all and other parameters like the mass of the Higgs and mass of the top, and in principle any new physics. That, that is up there. So in any physics would enter in, 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 in this delta R. So now we can look for it and see if there are inconsistencies. And what we find is actually there is a, a small inconsistency because um, if we look at this in, in this plot, we have the mass of the W against effective sign and you can see uh, the, the green band, sorry, are the direct measurements while the blue blob is a fit on um, on, on these parameters, and you can see there is a small to see my inconsistency between what you measure and what you, what you expect. However, uh, so what does this two sigma means? Well, probably nothing, because of course you would, I mean, it, it's probably going away once we have better measurements or better calculations. However, it is at least intriguing for me to try to, to see if we can say anything about a new physics that would generate these two sigmas. 
and uh, we can start assuming perturbative coupling, then assuming that no, there are not too many weird things going on, then basically there are two options. One is uh, some fermions that lives around two to four TV that couples directly to the W or something probably scalar that couples only to the Higgs and is not charged until the extra week. So there are two to two options. Of course, this is not a lot, and in particular, it's not a lot to, you cannot really um, explain anything of the problems I was talking about earlier. So it's not, but it's still a good starting point if you really, if you believe that this was a, a sign of new physics, you can possibly then build a machine and trying to look exactly into it. Um, so the, the other thing I want to point out is that here I'm talking about a single point on these electroweak precision observables. And we actually have more than one point. We have 20 different observables, more or less. And, uh, and all of these are very well measured. Um, well, some more and some less, but these are the parameters with their measurements and their fit. And uh, when you, if you do a fit, it includes the whole set of electroweak precision observables, you can, in principle, receive a lot of information on a possible new physics. So the question then it becomes, uh, okay, how, how, can we, how can we use all of this stuff? How can we try to find a systematically, systematic way to look for new physics? Um, well, um, we can start writing an effective Lagrangian that does that, that would modify all those parameters, and this is the this is the, the, the Lagrangian in, in case. However, this is not really an optimal approach because this Lagrangian is not gauge invariant and it doesn't allow a perturbative calculation. So, of course, you cannot go all over the precise measurements, etc. So a little bit more, a little best, better way is to assume that the standard model is some low energy limit of an effective field theory. Uh, this effective field theory has to be built in, in a specific way where, first of all, you define some scale of new physics um, under which no new particle would appear apart from the standard model itself. And then you will have a set of operators that has to respect the standard model gauge symmetry so that when you go at lower energies, you will recover the standard model. Now, there have been a lot of studies on this effective field theory. I'm not going over them. I'm not really necessarily, I'm not really interested here to talk about all the limits that you can put on these operators. I'm more interested in trying to understand what this can tell us on the importance of next leading order calculation, importance of precision calculations in BSM physics. Um, and the first thing that we can notice is that we can define a renormalization that allows us to calculate um, order by order uh, loop corrections in this theory. Um, so, and then use that result to try to understand the effect of electroweak precision calculations in these uh, in, in these BSM theories. Uh, so we did exactly that. We considered uh, all the electroweak precision observables I showed you before um, and considering uh, and we did a fit considering uh, nexolating, including nexolating corrections to the EFT. The, the nexolating correction to the standard model are always included, just to clarify. So only the EFT putting uh, um, putting them or not. Uh, so in this in this plot, we have all the operators that affect electroweak precision observables here. And here is the size of the nexolating correction, meaning how much the size of the uh, of the bounds that you can put depends on uh, on putting in or not next leading order corrections. And what you can see is that you actually have up to 20, 30 percent corrections in these bounds. So that means that there are large uncertainties that are usually not taken care taking account in 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 fits that only account for leading order effects. 
um, or if you want, in, in more line with this talk, precise calculations are relevant even when you talk about BSM. So it's not just for the standard model itself. So to, 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 to put a summary of this first part, um, so what I've talked about is that the precision physics can, can tell us about new physics um, if you find any inconsistencies in the standard model with respect to what you expect. Uh, however, for now, there are no inconsistencies, unfortunately, so we cannot claim new physics anywhere. Um, but we at least learn a way to try to, to, to have to systematically investigate new physics with precision physics and that, for example, this EFTs method. But even in, in these EFTs methods, uh, precise calculations are, are relevant. So going back to the topic of this talk, I hope that I convinced you about the first two points uh, on, on the importance of precision measurements and precision calculation. So for the rest, I will go over um, how this Higgs sector is, it could be relevant for this kind of, 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 of studies. And first of all, I will remind you again that the, the one of the things that we're missing about the Higgs sector is the fact is the Higgs potential. And I also want to point out that um, this is not just a simple piece on the standard model because the shape of the, 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 of the Higgs potential is connected directly to the mechanism of electroweak symmetry breaking. So what we are really missing is to an, a, a real understanding on how the electroweak symmetry breaking works in the standard model or uh, I mean in nature. Um, um, well, we know the first term is the mass of the Higgs, so we are happy about that. And we know the vacuum expectation value uh, because we know the Fermi constant. So uh, we know all the couplings of this potential at least at three levels. So um, what we don't know is, well, we don't really have is the measurement of this coupling, a direct measurement of this coupling. Now for the rest of the talk, I will talk about the higgs stralinia coupling. Um, simply because the quartic coupling, the coupling for four Higgses is uh, probably not, we are not going to see it at LHC, we're not going to see it in future collider, we're not going to see it at FSCC or anything else. So that's a no. But for the trilinear, maybe we can say something. So let's start with that. How do we measure the Higgs trilinear coupling? Uh, well, the first way is just a standard way and is to measure the, the production of two Higgses. And these are in here, in, there are two uh, amplitudes that that, um, that enters in, in this process of leading order. Uh, and you can see that the one on the left has the Higgs trilinear in, in the center. Um, so, uh, but this is a kind of difficult channel to study. And the reason is that uh, it has a very, very small cross section compared to the single Higgs. Um, it, 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 compared to say single Higgs uh, is a uh, three order of magnitude smaller, uh, basically due to three things. One is that we have an, he a, 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 an extra heavy final state, the, the, the extra Higgs. We have an extra small coupling involved and that's the trilinear itself. And on top of that, there is also destructive interference between, between the two amplitudes there on, on, the, in, on the plot, in, in, on the screen. Um, but this is not the whole story, unfortunately, because if you remember, the main decay of the Higgs is into bottom. So the main channel for discovery would be two gluons into four bottoms that you can imagine in a Hadron Collider it is extremely difficult due to the large amount of QCD background. So that makes a, a strain into try to, to see this, this process directly. So uh, my collaborators and I try to have a more indirect approach uh, as we talk about indirect approaches here. Um, and, and one thing you can notice that the trilinear actually appears also at uh, leading, uh, next to leading order in single Higgs processes. Here, for example, I'm showing you the decay of the Higgs into, um, through vector bosons. And you can see that at one loop level, the Higgs appears, uh, the trilinear also appears here, the, the dots. 
So we can try to, to study how these processes de depend on, 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 on the trilinear. In order to do that, it's better to introduce an anomalous coupling. So um, multiply the Higgs trilinear by a kappa and try to modify this kappa and see what happens. So in order to do that, uh, we start with the cross section with the process that you're interested in the other leading order containing all the QCD corrections, adding a term that depends on this kappa lambda and depends on what kind of process you're interested in. Um, and then there is a, a general term, the Higgs wave function randomization, that is a little blob here on the right, and that depends quadratically on kappa lambda. Uh, so the, the, this, the, the, the validity of the calculation is uh, for this kappa less than 20, that is plentiful considering that um, if you consider other um, limits on this on this term, you usually cannot go more further than kappa equal to eight or something. So this is this is at least it's it's an interesting point of view. Um, so now this coefficient c one are, um, uh, are can be written in this way where the integration is over. All the phase space and everything else, and the amplitude, the M0, M1 are the amplitude leading order and next leading order. Um, here, we, uh, in these plots, I have uh, how the cross sections, the productions, and the decay of the Higgs depends on this kappa. Um, we have the different production and processes. It's not necessarily particularly interesting, but you can see that they they all depend in in some way in in some interesting way. So you can, in principle, try to extract information uh, from these processes. So you can try to extract information on the trilinear from these processes. Uh, this, however, is not the end of the story because uh, you can see that this trilinear appears also at uh, Two loop order in electroweak precision observables. Uh, the, 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 the diagrams here uh, are the ones that contribute to the correction to the mass of the W. So exactly the, 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 the delta R that I, that I show you a few slides ago. Um, and you can see that uh, they depend on the trilinear. So in principle, you can see, um, you can try to also use electroweak precision observables to find this result. Um, constraining, so these are some bunch of constraining that, that, that uh, we did for run one and run two LHC. Um, so in both cases, we have here the results from the Higgs pair production um, and the result from single Higgs production. Um, so for the results for a single production on run one were obtained by, by us using the data from the run one Atlas and CMS combined uh, combination, uh, plus uh, the electroweak precision observables from the PDG of the time. And uh, while for the run two data, the run two results actually were obtained by the Atlas collaboration, both for the single and double Higgs, uh, double Higgs productions, and were presented in Morion 2019. Uh, it's always nice when when experimental collaboration uses your uh, your methods. Um, so what you can see is that uh, in in all cases, the 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 these um, the bounds that you can obtain from single Higgs are competitive with the one you obtain with double Higgs. And I remind you that they all obtain from uh, completely independent sets of data. So in principle, when you combine them, you can obtain even better data. Uh, you also may notice here that for the run two, there is no electroweak precision observables. And that's because it's something that we are actually working on and possibly at the end of this month or next month should be out. Uh, and um, I cannot, I don't have now the, the, the plots to show you, but what I can tell you is that what you obtain is that also for run two electric precision observables are interesting. And as I was saying, when you combine everything together, you obtain even better results than taking all the single channels at a time. Okay, so for the last part, um, I just check that if, uh, if the things work, okay. For the last part, uh, I'm going to talk about, I'm, I want to step back uh, a little bit and, and talk about the double Higgs production again, because I said that from the experimental point of view, this is a very difficult channel, but I wasn't, I didn't say anything about 
our knowledge from the theoretical point of view. Okay, so from the theoretical point of view, uh, the two plot, the two diagrams that I'm showing here are well known. Uh, there is an exact analytical result, result since the 80s, so there's nothing to say about that. However, when you go at one at next to leading order, meaning two loop, uh, the results for now are uh, the full results are known only numerically. Um, and uh, and uh, well, these are nice results, of course, uh, but uh, unfortunately are also very computer um, uh, computationally very intensive. Considering that uh, to generate a single phase space point takes two hours on a um, on a quite powerful machine, so it, it's a quite of intensive calculation, and that means that there tend to be less uh, useful for general or less uh, um, more difficult to use. That's the better term. Uh, they are more difficult to use for general purposes like Monte Carlos or uh for bsm calculation so that that's tend to be a little bit of a problem so the question is why don't we have an analytical solution um and the reason why we don't have an analytical solution is that there are too many scales involved where too many here means three uh meaning the mass of the hicks of course the mass of the top that is the quark the ground inside and the transverse momentum of the Higgs. And well, there's also the energy of the, of, of the scattering, but we just can put that one outside and just uh, considering everything divided by the scattering. So, so we have three scales. Um, there have been many approaches to try to analytically calculate, to have an analytic approximation of this net leading order. Uh, the first one was simply to send the mass of the Higgs, mass of the top to infinity. Um, and that works pretty well, but only for energies less than 350 GV. That is the energy for a production of two Higgses, uh, sorry, two top on shell. Because of course you cannot imagine, you cannot say that the top uh, has an infinite mass when you have enough energy to produce it. Um, improvement of this calculation has been done considering very large but finite mass of the top. And this also works well, but again, only uh, below the two top threshold, so below the 350. Uh, so the other, the other side of the expansion is considering a very small mass of the top, and that works uh, pretty well, um, but only for energies above 750. Uh, this is a little bit more difficult to explain, but it has to do to, with the, the scattering angle of the, with the scattering angle of the interaction. So. Anyway, uh, so here in this two plot, we have the two expansion put one back to back. So uh, in both cases, we have the cross section of leading order, partonic cross section of leading order against the energy of the process. And in on the black on the on the left uh, plot, the black line is the full result, um, and the dashed line are the um, are the approximated result. Instead of the left, uh, on the left side, we have the, the blue line is a full result and the dashed line are the approximated high energy result. And you can see that, as I was saying, uh, everything is covered about, apart from the middle region between 350 and 750 GB. And that wouldn't be a big problem if it wasn't that these regions is, covers 95% of the hadronic cross-section for a LHC that runs at 13 TV. So that's evidently is a fundamental part of the of the of the cross section that we actually have no good approximation for. So um, let's see what's the problem. So as I said, there are three scales. What are the three scales? I'm saying the three. These are the three scales. Uh, now um, these two are always less than one, and this is simply due to some uh, kinematical, I mean, just for kinematic, kinematical reasons. So we can, in principle, always expand on them. Uh, however, the other one, we can either take it to be very large, and you have the large top mass expansion, or very small, and you have the high energy expansion. So the idea is, instead of doing that, we can just keep this, this third scale arbitrary and expand on the other two. Now, uh, the problem is that the amplitude itself does not depend on the 
um, on the on the on the on the transverse momentum of the vehicles on the PT. Now um, I want to avoid. I'm going to avoid to go on the technical details here. The only point, the only important point, is that we can actually replace this 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 expansion in terms of an expansion on the scattering angle. So you can do that. And that simplifies a lot the, the, the calculation. So now we only have to worry about these two uh, these two expansion parameters. So I said they are less than one. However, we also have to worry about how they um, what what happens with the mass of the top. Now the mass of the X is smaller than the mass of the top, so there's no problem there. However, the transverse momentum can, in principle, becomes larger than the mass of the top. So in order to see where, where our approximation starts not working anymore, we can look at how these approximations approximate the full result at different state, a different um, value of the energies for different uh, um, uh, expansion, for different uh, order of the expansion. And what you can see is that it works very, very well. It converges extremely rapidly. At low energies and it starts getting a little uh, weird around 500 600 gb but however it's still very good and it's still converging until 800 and 100 gb now to give you a little bit uh, to reassume this one it makes it a little bit better let's give a look at the at the plot so this is the cross section the partonic cross section leading order against the energy the black line is the full result and the yellow line that covers that the yellow dashed line it goes perfectly on top of it if you can notice that's the result of our approximation so this approximation covers the middle region exactly per perfectly so we did the did this the same calculation for the two loop that's a little bit more complicated and so these are the full result these are for the two loop the purple dots are the numerical result that i showed you earlier and uh, and the the blue lines that goes on top of it is our approximation. So you can see that even at two loops, it represent it, it gets exactly what you would expect, and actually also smoothing out the error stemming from the interpolation. So uh, that means that I mean it's even more useful in general. But on top of that, now it takes only four seconds on a MacBook Air to have a single phase space point instead of two hours on a powerful machine. So it's a different kind of, uh, of, of calculation. OK, um, so uh, for the future, just this one is something that uh, it, it should go. Uh, uh, we should, pre I mean, it, the paper is, uh, is being write written and should go out next uh, later next month, probably this month or next month. Uh, so we are we use the same kind of calculation for also the the, K, the, the production of a Higgs plus a Z from gluon fusion. Uh, and again, you see that also in this case, it represents very well, it the approximation reproduces very well the full result. Here you have the cross section. The black line again is the full result, and the, and the yellow line, it goes perfectly on top, even reproducing a little kink around 350. Uh, so the, the approximation seems to work very well in different approaches, too. Okay, so for the conclusion, LHC is a great machine and it delivered what it promised, the discovery of the Higgs. However, we now have to understand what to do about that. Uh, so um, precise measurements are a way to, to have a, an idea of where you have to go next. Uh, I hope I convinced you about that. Uh, of course, there have been a huge experimental effort on that, but it has to be supported by an equal theoretical effort. Uh, and in particular, in the SIG sector, there's, there's a lot of things that are going on, and both in experimental and theoretical world, and, uh, and there is still a lot to do, though. So thank you. This is <laughs> the last one. So we did it. Great. Thanks for, uh, for, for listening. Thank you for it, Paolo. Let's give him a, a round of applause here. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs>